Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm Cyril Wong. I think I have about eight collections, give or take. Yeah, and one short story collection and one novel. Start writing poetry? Uh, during my national service when I was bored out of my brains. Uh, so about 19 years old. Do you remember why you wanted to write poetry? Uh, I think because I was depressed and lonely and there was really nothing else to do and I had a very small notebook to carry around me in my number 4 uniform. What was your first poem about? Uh, oddly enough, Missing Home and Actually, missing my mom. My first poem was a, yeah, a happy poem about my family and missing home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would say it's happy because the poems after that was all about not missing home and not liking home and not liking my parents and stuff like that. Yeah. Malay. Oh, it's pretty hardcore. Isn't it? Oh, National Day. Ah. I don't know. We are. Uh, we are, we are an over-rehearsed country, right? Everything is... What do you feel your poetry is about now? Uh, I think it has always been about getting over something. And it's not just about ranting about it. It's in really getting over it and then moving on to a new place. And then to a new place after that. So it's really, I think, a narrative about transcending desire. If I were to link all my poems into a single strand, it's about transcending desire, attachment, move, move, moving on from pain, from hatred, self hatred, moving on from hurt, forgiving people, and then coming to a place of very, very introspective transcendence. You've often been described as, as the confessional poet of Singapore. How do you feel about that? Uh, I think technically Grace Chow was the first. <laughs> when she first uh, came out with that book, Wu Mango, I think I thought I think that would count as confessional. Uh, but I think she just never really developed a lot of the personal stories that were implied within it. So I did that with my books. On one hand, a lot of people say that you know I shouldn't allow myself to be pigeonholed pigeonholed by the term confessional. Mm. But on the other hand, I think in Singapore, that, that category becomes very political very quickly. And I kind of like that, so I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because everyone is always telling me when I, was, when I started out, oh, you cannot write about this, you cannot write about that. No one wants to read about your love poems, or your sex poems, or your poems about your family. No one cares. Like, uh... Do you think people care about your poems, about void decks, and about how great Singapore is? I don't think so. This is very much my own, I guess, definition. I mean, it borrows from all your, you know, Anne Sexton's and Robert Lowell's and all that, but there is some fundamental uh, truth in it. A truth that's derived, derived from personal experience, private, intimate relationships, uh, some kernel of truth from all of these relationships have to appear in the poems, have to be used to get to some higher truth. And there must be some kind of storyline as well about you know, these experiences. It can't be like you know, one-off events. The events must add up to a portrait of the poet as a, as a lover, as a son, uh, as a brother, you know, it has to be psychologically convincing. Hmm. I, I like that you used the word portraiture yeah. with poetry. Um, yeah. I think because I think in images, uh, if I weren't a poet, I would be, well, I still sing, but I would also do a lot of painting because I think first in images. So language to me is, is like a, Language to me is like a second language. Mm. When I see the world, when I react to the world, it's always very, very visual first. It doesn't make sense. And I, I have to find the words to, to make sense of it or to communicate it to a reader. Mm. 
uh, a kind of hush from my fourth collection, Unmarked Treasure, would be quite visual. Uh, that's when I know that uh, I'm kind of like on the edge of not making any sense at all, at all, where the poem is just complete abstract images, but I have to somehow readjust and edit the poem again and again and again until it makes sense in words. Mm. But behind the words, the images are actually very ineffable, pretty indescribable. So my biggest challenge is always very, it's a very paradoxical uh, position. I have to make sense of something that doesn't make sense in words. So I think that poem kind of sums it up. Mm. That's my most abstract, my most, my most crazy surrealist poem. Yeah. Do you want to read a little bit of it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, a kind of hush. Okay, where is it? It's so ineffable, I can't even find it. Hello? That's why books have content pages. No, not this one, oh. which someone actually commented about. Because, yeah, I don't know why I didn't have... I think because you, the poles float. They didn't want to mark the treasure. Yeah, because it, I, I felt like it was more like a novel. I mean, no one, no one gives you a content page for a novel, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah. Like, chapter 1 is on page 3. Chapter 2 is on page 19. No, I mean, no one does that. So I, I wanted it to, to, to flow. Mm. So, a kind of hush had a lot of images like this. Uh... Something would surface from under the wind-troubled faces of murky ponds our minds had become. Ripples would flee in a singular outward direction. These questions of guilt or blame. So the words always come after the image to try and explain what I think those images were trying to tell me. It's like trying to an analyze a dream after you wake up. It's like, what's the dream about? And when you analyze a dream, you use words. Mm. And sometimes I feel that the words are not complete, but I think poetry is the best I can do to communicate that. Abstraction. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Should I turn it up to camera actually? That poem. Yeah. Oh, this poem. Yeah. It's on the left or the right, sorry. Uh, here. Is that right? R r r right, yes. Kind of hush. Yeah. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. That's why I don't drive. <laughs> oh, you don't drive? Okay. Neither do I actually. I will kill people. <laughs> No, yeah, because I... Do you, do you face out? I face out, you know. The moments where I just... Oh yeah, all the time. Yeah, it takes a lot of effort to like... I, I think that's why poetry appeals to me more because of its short form. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it takes less effort to write poetry, but its short formness is very good for attention spans that are not so... Yeah, yeah. But then it's, it's, it's not... People make it sound like short attention span is so terrible, but... But my short attention span is very intense one, you know. <laughs> and when it's very intense, got a lot of crazy things come up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and a, a lot of people get very intimidated when I actually enter that full mode of, like, you know, short attention span. <laughs> then they go, okay, enough, enough. Phase out, phase out, phase out. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yes, I'm very strange. In intensity and poems. Uh... Yeah. If it's not intense, it's not a poem. What's your most intense uh, moment being a poet? Huh. Well, a lot lah. I mean, the writing of the poem itself is very, very intense. Uh, because I'm completely in the moment. Everything disappears. Who I am disappears. It's just me, I don't know, being some kind of higher, not higher, an alternative version of myself that's just observing what is happening to me, if that makes sense. And then the other in intense part is communicating that first version of intensity to a whole new audience. That is very scary. Because uh, you don't know whether the people will understand you or not. And I find that kind of understanding, misunderstanding, reading, misreading from another person very, very intense. Because I can get either very hurt by it, or I can get very, you know, what's the word? Happy doesn't, happy doesn't even begin to, begin to describe it. You really feel like, wow, you feel one with the world, with the kind of feeling. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty intense. 
everything else in between I can ignore. Mm. People who are indifferent, people who are like, eh, don't know what it's about. But people who really hate me, and people who really, really see some kind of like soulful connection with me, that's intense. Mm. Mm. If there was any place to hide other than at home or in a library in oh. Singapore? Uh, in plain sight, like, you know, uh, hawker centres. I love hawker centres. If it's not too hot lah. Because it's like, I love the white noise of HDB neighbourhoods mm. where you are just nobody, you know, and no one expects anything of you. No one is really judging you because they don't know you. They haven't read your work. They don't care, mm. you know, that I can feel very nicely alone mm. in an open space like that. Mm. I think some of my best poems come out of such spaces. That and buses. Mm. I've sent text messages to myself very often in buses or at hawker centres. <laughs> I feel like a bus that goes through all, all good places. Yes. All good vibes. Yes, that I want to be at. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Alright. Mm. Anything else you want to kind of... Bitch about. Or fit into... To, to your readers one day, to the future, when you look at this? Oh, gosh. Just that when I was writing, when I'm writing now, or in the future, I hope there are more poets like me. Because there, there just isn't enough. More people, too many people are just afraid to write about the things that I write about, or just write about themselves, about their lives in poetry, stop treating poetry like some kind of elevated uh, art form that can only talk about certain things. It's not that, you know, more poets should just come out in all senses of the word. Just come out in your writing. It's just not enough. I'm always waiting. It's like waiting for ghosts to crawl out of the walls, you know. Like, oh, hurry up. I'm sh this is poetry. It's the most introspective art form. Why aren't there more personal, confessional, queer, transgender poets coming out and writing about their lives? Mm. There's just not enough. Mm. Got it. Any advice for people who want to seek that bravery? Uh, find support in friends first. Yeah. It's only with love and support from people who care about you that you get that kind of courage. I had that. Yeah. Although I, I also had friends who ran, uh, like, left the country and became poets elsewhere, you know, became their own little Emily Dickinsons, you know, just write for myself. <laughs> In the middle of Missouri. Like, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. you're happy, it's fine. Mm. I stuck it out here. I think there's a lot of people you've saved by sticking here. Incidental. I think I see it as an incidental, incidental thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I stuck here, that I happen to help people. Mm. Uh, it's always after the fact. I mean, I only find out that I have been helping people, like, you know, when you meet readers that come up to you and go like, wow, okay, wow. You were actually moved by something that I wrote it moved you to do something courageous. It's like, wow, I never... I mean, firstly, I'm a poet. I never knew that a poem can do that to you. I never knew that I, as a poet, can do that for you. I said, wow, great. And I guess that fueled me in a way to carry on. Mm -hmm. But it was never the starting point. The starting point was always me, because I'm a narcissist. <laughs> Yeah, but people don't admit it.